have your Bible with you this morning. Go ahead and take it out and go over into your Old Testament. Please take out your Weather. Four hundred years. Four hundred. Testament and. It's only four, four small chapters. They're very These kinds are of very interesting. God's These were about four. We're about four. They came to the crisis that they wouldn't give their governor. They had enough sense to realize that their governor would not be pleased with such feeble and defective animals. Malachi also says they were not honoring God as a son honors his father. They were not honoring God as a servant as to honor his, his master through their weak and feeble and, and defective and blind and worthless animals. They were dishonoring God. They were despising the name of the Lord. They were showing no respect for God. They were not giving excellence to the excellent God. These people during this time, through their sacrifices, they were dishonoring God, but not only were they failing to honor God. Secondly, according to Malachi, they were also failing to honor their marriages. They were failing to honor their marriages. Go back to Malachi chapter 2, look at verse 13. In verse 13, God says, this is another thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and with groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth against whom you've dealt treacherously, though she's your companion and your wife by covenant. But no one has done so who has a remnant of the Spirit. And what did that one do while he was seeking a godly offspring? Take heed into your spirit and let no one deal treacherously against the wife of your youth. For I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. And him who covers his garment with wrong, says the Lord of hosts. So take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. Notice how like what is commonly practiced in, in our society today. Like what is commonly going on in 21st century America, these people here also were not honoring their marriage commitments. Do you see that? In verse number 14, we see that they were dealing treacherously with the wives of their youth. In other words, they were mis mistreating their wives. They were abusing the wives they were bound to by the law of God. There was a lot of divorce going on in this time. And instead of loving the wives, they were bound to by the love of God, by the law of God. And instead of treating them with, with respect, instead of being there for them for better and for worse and through sickness and in health until death did them part, Malachi says these men were divorcing their wives. They were divorcing these their wives so they could, could marry women from other nations. So they could marry women from, from nations that God wanted them to stay away from. Nations that God knew would lead them down the path of idolatry. Nations that would put them on the same path that, that took them in the Babylonian captivity. God says these men, they were divorcing the wives. They were bound to by the law of God. 
They were divorcing the wives of their youth to marry women from heathen nations. They were dishonoring their marriage commitments, but not only were they dishonoring their marriages, they also failed in tithes and offerings. Another way we can we can say this is at this time these people are failing in their giving to the Lord. Look at Malachi chapter three. In Malachi chapter three and verse number eight, the Bible says, Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me, but you say, How have we robbed you? And tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Brothers and sisters, this is strong language used by the prophet. This is very strong language. Notice here how how God says that during this time, the people of Israel were guilty of robbing him. Let me ask you something. You ever been robbed before? You ever had somebody break into your home or break into your car? or break into your office, or break into your locker at school, and take something that that, that belongs to you, take something from you unjustly? You ever been robbed before? Well, God says these people were robbing him. God says these people at this time were guilty of robbing him. And someone says, well, how did these people rob God? Well, look carefully at the text. Look carefully. It says that they were guilty of robbing God of tithes and offerings. You see, under the Old Testament law of Moses, the people of Israel were commanded to give a tithe. That is, they were commanded to give 10% of their blessings back to the Lord. This was something that was commanded under the Old Testament law of Moses, but evidently, these people were not doing that. That They were not giving to God properly. Instead of giving to God properly, they were being selfish. They were being stingy. They were being. They were withholding from God what He demanded, and in the process, they were robbing Him. They were robbing God. And some may say, "Well, why would they rob God? Why would these people withhold from God what He asked for?" Well, that's a great question, and the answer to that question is found in the next verse. Look at verse ten in Malachi chapter three, verse number ten. God says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house, and test me now in this, says the Lord, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Ladies and gentlemen, here we see exactly why the people of Israel were robbing God. Here we see the people of Israel at this time, the reason why they were not giving properly, the reason why they were robbing God is because they didn't trust God. They didn't trust that God would take care of them and bless them if they gave as they were supposed to. These people did not trust God. Here in this verse, God tells them, if you just give right, If you just give to me like you're supposed to, you're going to see some amazing things. God God told them that if you just bring me the whole time, if you just give to me like I have prescribed in the law, then you have everything you need. I will open up the windows of heaven and pour blessings upon you until they overflow. God told these people that their own selfishness was holding them back. I told these people he was ready to shower them with so many blessings, but he couldn't do that because they were stingy. They were they were selfish in their giving. These people failed to honor God. They failed to honor their marriages. They, they failed in tithes and offerings. And I guess if we could sum all these things up into one statement, we could say that these people failed to love God. These people have become a sinful and rebellious people because they fail to love God. And please understand, God did not fail to love them. In fact, at the very beginning of this book, God makes it very clear that he loved these people. Look at Malachi chapter 1 and verse number 2. In Malachi chapter 1 and verse number 2, the Bible says, I have loved you, says who? Says the Lord. It, God says, I have loved you, Israel. But look at the next part. But you say, how have you loved us? God told these people, I love you. I have loved you. That's what God said emphatically. And yet even though God announced that, they still, they still question God's love. Do you see that? They question the love 
of God, despite all God had done for them, despite the fact that he had given them a nation, a land rather flowing with milk and honey, despite the fact that he had blessed them to be exalted above all the other nations at this time, despite the fact that God blessed them over and over and over again, they still had the audacity to ask God, how have you loved us? These people question the love of God. They question God's love for them. But here's the truth about the matter, brothers and sisters. The truth about the matter is this. These people had no right to question God's love for them, but God certainly had a right to question their love for him. God had that right because of a verse like this. In Malachi chapter 1 and verse 13, it says, God said to the nation, you also say, my, how tiresome it is. And you disdainfully sip in it, says the Lord of hosts. And you bring what was taken by robbery and what is lame or sick. So you bring the offering. Should I receive that from your hand, says the Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, after reading this, let me ask you something. Who, who do you think is failing to love who at this time? Is it that God is failing to love the people of Israel? Or is it that the people of Israel is, is failing to love God? Well, I think after reading this verse, it's very clear what the answer is. After reading this verse, it's very clear that during this time, the people of Israel have failed to love God. That was the reason why they were doing the stuff they were doing. That's the reason why they were offering the weak and the feeble animals as sacrifices. That's why they weren't giving God their best. That's why they were robbing God of tithes and offerings. That's why they were not honoring their marriage commitments. That's why they were showing God no honor and no respect. That is why they were they were looking at serving God as a chore and not as a blessing. Notice again what the text says. They said, oh, how tiresome it is. With that language, they're telling God, it's a chore to serve you. It's tiresome to serve you. It's not a privilege. That's why they said this kind of stuff. These people are failing God in all these areas because they didn't love God. It wasn't that God didn't love them. It was that they did not love God. He was not the number one priority in their lives. Now, my friends, these are just some of the failures of the people of Israel in the time of Malachi. And I'm pretty sure some of you are sitting there and you're wondering, well, why did we just spend the last 20 minutes talking about these things? Some of you are probably wondering, why are we just for the last few minutes talking about the failures of Israel? Well, listen very carefully. We spent the last few minutes talking about the failures of Israel because it occurs to me that usually around this time of the year, we as people, we as human beings, begin to take inventory of our lives, do we not? Usually when a current year is about to close, and a new year is about to begin, we as people, we begin to evaluate ourselves. We begin to examine ourselves. We, de- we begin to make some goals and, and consider where we need to improve as we head in the new year. That's the kind of stuff we do. We do that kind of stuff around this time of the year. And that being the case, I think, like, I think a book like the book of Malachi is a great book for us to consider. I think this is a good book for us to study, especially around this time of the year, because this book challenges us. It challenges us to ask ourselves some very important questions about the progress we've made for God during the current year and the progress we want to make for God in the coming year. So as you evaluate your own life today, as you sit there in that pew and evaluate your own personal walk with Jesus, what do you honestly see? What do you see this morning? How do you honestly line up in comparison to the rebellious people of Israel in the time of Malachi? For example, how have you done in 2016 when it comes to honoring God? Have you been honoring God this year? Have I been honoring God this year? Have we been honoring God this year? I mean, can we honestly say that in the things we've been doing this year, we've been giving God our best service? 
You know, it's interesting to me that when it comes to us as Christians, as citizens in the kingdom of God, God does not require that we offer animals, right? God does not require that we offer animal sacrifice to him. Instead, under the new covenant, God requires that we offer our lives as a sacrifice to him. In Romans chapter 12 and verse number 1, the Apostle Paul says to Christians, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, which is acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Notice how, according to the Apostle, as Christians, God expects us to offer our very lives, our very bodies, as a living sacrifice to Him. Practically speaking, that means that we got to give God our best service all the time. And all that we do for the Lord, we got to do it with zeal. And we got to do it with passion. We got to do it fervently. We got to do it with all our might, with all our strength. That is what the excellent God deserves from all of His people. That's what He deserves from me. And that's what He deserves from you. But the question is, in 2016, have we been doing that? In 2016, have we been giving God our best service? Have we been giving God our our best in, in our worship, even on this day, this day, December the 18th, as we've come together to worship God, have we been giving God our best today? Have we been giving God our best effort in our worship? For example, did we give God our best during the Lord's Supper? When we took the Lord's Supper just a few minutes ago, did we really concentrate on what that was all about? Did we really think back to the time of the cross? Did we examine ourselves? Did we take it in a worthy manner? Or did we just break that cracker and drink that juice and check it off on our box of, of spiritual things to do? And what about when it comes to the singing that Brother Derek led us in? Did we sing out? Did we sing loud? Did we sing with the understanding? Did we sing focusing? On the words of each song, singing, making melody in our hearts with thanksgiving. Did we do that this morning? Or, or what about when it comes to the preaching for the last 20 minutes? Have we been listening carefully? You've been listening carefully this morning? You've been following along in your Bible? You've been, you've been examining your own heart and your own life with the Word of God? And what about this morning? This morning, did we, did we strive to be on time for worship? Did we strive to be on time for worship like we're going to strive to be on time for work tomorrow? And what about even before worship? Did we come to Bible class this morning? Did we come to Bible class because we want to grow in God? We want to grow in Jesus. We want to know more about Jesus. And what about the acts of service that we've been, been engaged in? Throughout the course of the year, whether it's teaching a Bible class a quarter or two, or lean singing, or presiding over the Lord's table, or serving as an elder, or a deacon, or a preacher, or someone who helps organize and decorate classrooms, or someone who's part of the evangelism group, or someone who does some behind the scenes that nobody but you and God know about, it doesn't matter what you may do. Whatever you've done for God this year, have you done it with all your might? Have you done it with zeal and with passion? Have you done it to the glory of God? Unlike the people of Israel in the time of Malachi, this year in 2016, have I been honoring God? Have I been giving God my best effort in all that I do for Him? Or have I been giving Him junk? Have I been giving God junk this year? And what about this? What about when it comes to our marriages? I'm reminded what Jesus says in Matthew 19 and verse 6. In Matthew 19, Jesus tells us about the sanctity of marriage. In Matthew 19 and verse 6, Jesus says that when a man and a woman marry, God joins them together. He says, well, God has joined together. Let no man separate. He, he says that God makes them one. That means that God literally glues them together for a lifetime. That's what God does when, when a man and a woman get married. Jesus says that marriage is the most sacred relationship that two people can enter into. But, but the question is, have I been honoring my marriage this year? 
In other words, have I been striving to keep the vows that I made on the day I got married? May the 12th, 2003. I remember my anniversary. So hope I can get some brownie points for that. Have I been doing the things that Paul speaks of in Ephesians chapter 5? Have I been honoring my, my spouse? Cherishing my spouse, loving my spouse, respecting my spouse as a man. Have I embraced my responsibility to be a leader of my family, to be a leader of my wife and my children? Have I been dealing with my wife in an understanding way? Women, have you embraced your responsibility? Have you been a, a good helpmate to your husband? Have you been submissive to his leadership? What kind of spouse have we been in 2016? Have we been good spouses or have we been very bad spouses? Have I been unfaithful to my spouse? Have I broken the trust of my spouse in any way? Have I been, been rude and ugly to my spouse all the time? Have I been diminishing their influence in front of our children? Have I been saying things that are hurtful and crushing to their self-esteem? Have I used the terrible D word, the word divorce, in any argument or disagreement that we've had in 2016? Unlike the people of Israel, have I been honoring my marriage commitment this year? And then what about this? What about our giving? How have we been doing with our giving this year? You know, while we are not commanded to tithe like the people of Israel in the Old Testament, as Christians, we're still commanded to give, right? We're still commanded to give generously and, and, and sacrificially. The question is, have I been doing that or have I been robbing God? Someone says, oh, the preacher, he's talking about money now. Oh, boy, he's talking about giving. Is he trying to buck for a raise? He trying to ask for a raise? In an indirect way, no, my friend, I'm not asking for a raise. That's ridiculous. But I am going to talk about money. I am going to talk about giving. You know why? Because the book of God does. And so we go to 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 1, a verse that Brother Tim referred to just a few minutes ago. And 1 Corinthians 16 and verse number 1, on the first day of the week, each one of you used to save. And put aside and save as he may prosper. We're supposed to give as we prosper. Second Corinthians chapter 9. Second Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 6. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do just his purpose in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion. For God loves the cheerful giver. Brothers and sisters, the word of God speaks about giving. The word of God tells us Christians that we need to give. We need to be generous and sacrificial in our giving. We need to be generous and sacrificial in our giving, not to the preacher, not to the local church, but to God. We give to God. That's who we give to. We give to God, not to the church. We give to God, not to the preacher, not to the elders. We give to God. Specifically, we give to support the work of God. You see, we need to understand, like everybody else, we also live in this world as Christians. We live in this world, and guess what? Living in this world means you need some money sometimes to do certain things. Let me tell you something. you got to have money for these lights to come on this morning. CPWS is not going to give us a pass on paying the light bill because we are church. You also got to have money to buy Bible class materials and to buy a sound system and a security system and you got to have money to support preachers here and in other places across the globe and you got to have money to offer benevolence to saints who were hit with catastrophes and you got to have money to repair the carpet when the water fountain, water fountain busts in and it leaks all night you need money for that too you got to have money to do certain things and these are the kinds of things that God says we have authority to use the money that's collected on the first day of the week for, and it's important that we understand that. It's important that we understand that our giving is one of the main things that brings us into fellowship as a local church. Our giving is one of the main ways in which we honor God. 
with the blessings He has given us. It is one of the main ways in which we invest ourselves in the most important work in the world. You can tell a lot of times what means a lot to you in life by where you put your money, where you invest in it. See, this is something that the people of Israel, they failed to understand this in the time of Malachi. In the time of Malachi, the people of Israel failed to give properly because they did not trust God. They failed to understand that their giving was, a, was critical in God's work being accomplished. Instead of giving properly, they robbed God. They, they held on to their money as though it really belonged to them. And the question is, where do we line up today in comparison to them? 2016, and we've been honoring God. And we've been honoring our marriages, and we've been robbing God. And then finally, can I talk a little bit, just for a few minutes, about our love for God? Can we talk about that for a couple of minutes? Remember in Matthew 22, in verse 37, Jesus tells us what it means to love God, doesn't he? He says you love God with all your heart, with all your strength, all your soul, and all your mind. Jesus tells us what it means to, uh, to love God, but the question is, have we been loving God? Have we been loving God? Unlike Israel, have we been appreciating the love of God? Do we believe that God loves us? In 2016, have we clearly been able to see the love of God in our lives? Have we been thankful for our blessings this year? On our prayers, do we constantly gripe and tell God we wish we had more? Do we look at serving God as tiresome, as a chore? When we got up this morning, did we drag our feet? Did we say, oh, it's just so cold outside, I want to go get in that bed and wrap up again? Or we, were we still excited to come here? Because we love God, and we want to worship God, and we know God is worthy of our praise. As Christians, do we look at the lives of of other people, and we say, man, I, being a Christian is just so boring. I wish I was out there in the world. Do we understand that with everything God tells us in His Word, it's always got our best interest in mind. There's nothing but love behind the instructions in this book. Do we understand that God loves us so much that He gave us His best and we were at our worst? Remember Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, there Paul says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while you were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Brothers and sisters, have we found ourselves appreciating what that verse says more than ever in 2016? Unlike the people in the time of Malachi, can we honestly say this morning that we love God? I submit to you that there's only one proper way to answer that question, and Jesus does it. And John 14, verse 15, there Jesus says, If you love me, you'll do what? You'll keep my commands. Jesus says, If you love me, then you just do what I say. You will, you will obey my instruction. Now, can I be clear about something very quickly? Let me be clear about something. I don't want you to think that I've been trying to, to beat us down in the sermon this morning. That's not the point. I'm not trying to beat us down by answering or asking these questions, but I do believe that these are all questions that we seriously need to consider as we head into 2017. In fact, there are two important things that we really need to appreciate from these questions. First, we need to understand this morning that if we are failing God in any of these areas, if we are failing God in any of these areas, in our lives right now, we need to understand that God says that is unacceptable. It is unacceptable. I'll go back to Malachi one more time. Malachi chapter 1. And Malachi chapter 1, look at verse 10. Remember in verse number 9, God talked about their weak and feeble sacrifices. And in verse number 10, He says, Oh, that there, would, there were one among you who would shut the gates, that you might not use, uselessly kindle fire on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord, Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from you. In verse number 11, his, he says his name was to be great among the nations. In verse number 14, he says he's a great king, and his name is to be feared among the nations. I just want you to notice how God was so upset 
with the weak and feeble sacrifices that these people were offering him that he said he would rather the gates of Jerusalem just be shut down. He said, just close the gates. Close the gates of Jerusalem. Shut down the altar. See, God wanted these people to understand that he's a great God. He's an excellent God. He is one to be feared and respected and honored. He did not deserve junk. He did not deserve mediocrity from his people. So number one, we got to understand that if we've been failing God in these areas, God says it's unacceptable. But secondly, we need to also understand that if we've been failing God in these areas, we can change. In fact, we can change today. Today, we can get a fresh start in the Lord. Today, we can get right with the Lord, but it's going to start with us first changing our hearts. It's going to start with us truly loving God. Again, Israel's main failure at this time is they didn't love God. That was the source of their problems. But even with all their problems, and they had a lot of them. In the last chapter of Malachi, Malachi 4, God's going to give them some hope. In his final admonition to the people of Israel before the closing of the Old Testament, God's going to mention how in time he's going to send a messenger to prepare the way for the Messiah. And this messenger would be John the baptizer, and the Messiah would be Jesus. You see, through Jesus, God would demonstrate the ultimate expression of his love for all mankind. Through Jesus, God would make a way to save us from our sins. He would make a way for us to go to heaven. And if that doesn't motivate us alone to want to give God our best in 2017, I don't know what in the world will. But God's final message to Malachi is you better get right. You better start giving me your best because the Messiah is coming. He's coming. And so this morning, as you consider the final message of the Old Testament, the message of Malachi, I just want to close by asking you, where are you? Where are you this morning? Have you been giving God your best? Or have you been giving Him junk this year? Mediocrity. Have you been giving Him mediocrity this morning? You can change. You can come to Him. You can rededicate yourself to Him. And Him being the loving and gracious God that He is, He'll forgive you. He will forgive you. Or, or maybe you've never served God at all this year. Maybe for, for 51 Sundays or 50 Sundays out of this year, you've been putting off obeying the gospel over and over and over again. This morning, you can change also. You can believe in Jesus, finally. You can turn away from sin, finally. You can be baptized into Christ, finally, and receive remission for your sins. But this morning, there's someone here who hasn't been giving the excellent God excellent and you want to change the direction of your life as we head into the new year, then you have an opportunity to do that right here and right now as we stand and as we sing.